when you are putting together your tests, it would be most helpful, I think, if you were to put the page number uh, where you're getting your question for your for the person who's going to be taking your test, so that when we go back over the tests, you know, as a class, as a springboard for a discussion, we can go to that page, and it'll just help us uh, expedite and make make the discussion that follows more efficient. Uh, we are. Um, I'm, I'm happy to to announce that. Uh, we have about 10 or 11 more titles that have been added to our Perry Council Library. They are still in the bag upstairs, but they're in the library. They're in the bag on the floor. Uh, Rachel hasn't yet cataloged them, but they are there. So um, we now we now have a fairly good library, fairly nice, you know. We still have more titles that we could get, but these are the titles that I um, highlighted that we I, 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 we absolutely want. So we have pretty much all the titles that we absolutely want. Like I said, we don't have all of them, but we have enough that we, can, we have a substantive uh, resource. I think we have two or three titles, of, uh, copies of each title. Um, remember again, um, we have I, I don't have anyone yet. So it's all up. It's all on Rachel now, but I haven't really talked to her yet about how she's going to uh, organize it so that the students of the class of the school can check those books out for a week. Um, one copy of one title, uh, one copy of each title, each of course. Uh, but um, um, you know, parishioners may not check out those books. They can look at them in the library. But they may not check out those books because we need them. Um, maybe when we're not, the school is not in session. If we can figure out a way to check them out to parishioners so that they they, they don't uh, ascend to heaven before the time, um, we'll fit, we we can do that. Um, another item would be um, I'm going to ask you to bear with me. I don't. I think that I'd like to wait to see how these classes go. This class, the next class to see how far we get uh, in the uh, reading assignments before I take the time, which is becoming uh, increasingly less, um, uh, to, uh, to assign the readings from Orthodox worship uh, by Archimedes Gregorius. Uh, and I might just choose from now just to kind of maybe to stay two or three weeks ahead rather than trying to anticipate the whole semester, because I don't know how this is going to go tonight. I can imagine, I, can, I, I would not be surprised if uh, we decide at the end of this class that uh, we have not yet, we have not uh, covered it sufficiently. Uh, and we may want to uh, give next week also to the uh, substance of this evening of class. Uh, we do, I do, I am, um, I feel that these first two classes are very important. So, you know, when you are uh, when you're um, setting up a retaining wall, let's say, um, what's the absolutely most critical thing that you do? Set a good foundation. You set a good foundation, and you take time to make sure that foundation is level, right? And straight. There's not one stone above another. So I feel that these first two classes are the foundation uh, for our our uh, our theology. So we'll take as much time as we feel we need to, without you know, without spending too much time. But we'll take as much time as we feel that we need to. Um, now the last item uh, for housekeeping housekeeping. Um, I told my wife that I, when I came home from uh, Mogador, uh, the Diocesan Assembly of Mogador, Ohio, that I, I felt that I had scored a major coup. Um, I secured the uh, commitment of His Eminence to come speak with us. Um, I didn't have to twist his arm at all. He's, 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 he loved to do this. Um, so he will be uh, with us 
of the weekend of uh, the Sunday before meat fair, which happens to be also the annual chili cook-off. <laughs> so he'll be with us that weekend, and then he'll stay over and talk to us, he'll speak to us, the class that Monday evening. I've asked him to uh, prepare something that you know is, is right up his alley. I asked him, uh, I'll, you, know, you can modify this any way you want to, Your Eminence. But here's the idea. Um, I want you. I'm going to ask you to share with us um, the vision of the church that is hidden in the canons of the church. I will ask him then to show you the book that contains the canons of the church. It's called the Rudder. Um, but that's not what, that's not the coup. I mean, that was a coup. I told my wife I scored a major coup. The major part was when Father Esteban, our Vice Chancellor, who's, who's become a dear friend of mine uh, for reasons which constitute a very interesting story, um, when he found out that I had asked the bishop to come, he kind of he kind of got on me. He said, why didn't you invite me? I'll come. And I said, would you? <laughs> you would? Um, he said, yes. So he's also going to come, uh, if the uh, bishop allows it. Um, uh, Father Esteban says that the bishop owes him. Um, <laughs> he's taken him to a number of trashy places, you know, uh, over potholes, dri driving him through potholes and through dark alleys. And he says the bishop owes him to take him to a nice place, like St. Herman's. <laughs> Um, I don't know if I, you know, I hesitate to share this, but I, 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 uh, I get a kick out of it, so I, I can't restrain myself. Um, when Father Esteban is not feeling well, or even maybe when he is, uh, he likes to surf the, uh, the web pages of the various parishes in the diocese. And he'll watch the uh, live stream or the, uh, the recordings of the liturgy. Sunday morning liturgy, and so he, he found us, and he's fallen in love with our choir, uh, with our liturgy, and he is looking forward very much to coming to St. Herman's and uh, visiting us and serving with us. As I told you on Sunday morning, I feel that Father Esteban is, is certainly, he, he's one of the sharpest minds in the OCA. He's just, he's absolutely brilliant. Uh, and just a very dear man. So I've asked him, you know, if we're going to have the both of them there, I'm going, let, let's put Father Esteban to work as well. So I'm going to, my, my plan right now is that we'll have Father, uh, His Eminence present to us on the vision of the church that's hidden in the canons of the church. Oh, 45, let's say 50 minutes or so, 50 minutes to an hour. And then I'll ask, we'll ask Father Esteban to respond. 15, 20 minutes for the purpose of, uh, of uh, getting a discussion going between His Eminence, Father Esteban, and then I will join them, we'll form a three-man panel, and we'll start talking back and forth with each other in the hope that it will draw you in. And then you'll start asking questions, and it'll become a four-man, then a five-man, six-man, then a seven-man, one woman, then a seven-man, two women, you'll uh, do a conversation, and, and eventually all of us involved in this conversation in response to His Eminence's uh, remarks. Um, so um, we have uh, some uh, some uh, generous uh, people who have donated funds towards the purchase of these titles that are now in the library, and we have monies left over. So um, I am thinking that unless the donors have uh, have a different view, uh, I'm thinking that we might use those monies. Uh, for the stipend that we would offer to His Eminence and to Father Esteban. Uh, if, if, you, if you would rather not, please let me know. Um, and, but even so, I, you know, um, donations are, 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 will, be, will be useful. Um, there are others that uh, I would like to invite to come talk to us, um, and that we would be bringing them from out of state. Uh, um, so, they may not all be as cheap as Father, as uh, Bishop Daniel and Father Esteban, because 
the travel and the um, the travel will be covered for them by the diocese. We would cover their lodging and the stipend. Um, it, these others that I would like to bring would not be covered by the diocese. So we would have to cover their lodging as well and their travel. So anyway, um, uh, something for us to look forward to. So I propose, it's 7.15, I propose that we go to, let's say, we'll see how this works. Um, you know, we're, 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 we're feeling our way through this new, this new format, um, uh, this new venture here at St. Herman. So I propose that we go until about 7.45, take a five, ten minute break, and then we'll finish it out till 8.30. All right? Yeah. Right. Any objections? <laughs> Going once, twice, thrice, and let's do it. So this first session, this first half hour then, um, let's, um, let's, uh, let me offer to you these, uh, some springboard questions. Um, and then we'll, let's get a conversation going from these springboard questions. The first of which is this. Um, I, I asked you, I sent it to you online. Uh, I asked you, um, uh, if you, if you, if you printed it out, you have it in front of you, uh, or you have, it on, you have it on your screen in front of you, whatever. Um, from your reading, even if you didn't read all of it, you didn't have a chance to read all of it, from what you did read, what fundamental convictions do you feel coming out of Pomazansky, St. John of Damascus, and Archimandri Gregorius? What convictions, what like fundamental convictions? What happened to my, here it is. Um, all right, well, I can figure this out. Oh, let me get this tablet up and you'll be thinking. What fundamental convictions do you feel, not just that you surmise, but that you feel coming out of what you're reading? Any thoughts from anybody? Uh, the, the big thing that I just keep coming back to is how all of the different sources of Orthodox theology lead into and require each other, and almost all heresies in some way either elevate one against the others or ignore all of the others. They're, they're a cohesive whole that must be viewed as a whole. All right. Would you uh, say that's a conviction? Uh, I think so. I would say not. I mean, it, it, what you're saying is absolutely true, but I want you to go deeper. Okay. What's driving that? There's something driving that. And what you say is absolutely true, and it's very important. But it stands on something. So what I'm, that's what I'm asking you to get to. What is it that that practice stands on, that all of these sources go together? You cannot separate one from the other, or elevate one from the other. Well, that's not quite true. You, we, we, the Holy Scripture is is the foundation, mm -hmm. but uh, why? You know why? What do you think? This mm -hmm. isn't going to work because I can't reach it. I mean, perhaps, uh, perhaps the idea that the faith as it is must be preserved. I guess I'm getting that sense from a lot of what I'm reading. All right, but again, I mean, I, I, you're absolutely right. Tradition, mm -hmm. but why? Whatever. Uh, I think the, uh, the common denominator with all the sources that Pomazansky listed, I think, was uh, divine revelation. Oh, that's what I was looking for. So, um, divine revelation, what, is, what does that, um, what does that mean? That you understand divine things. That's true. God revealed it. Yeah. God revealed it to a person or people. All right. Tom? I'd add on to that um, that it's revealed specifically for our benefit and for our salvation. Okay. Do I see any other hands? It's what God has, has <clears throat> deigned for us to be able to understand. All right. And, you know. All right. But Everything you're saying is true. Avery? I would, I would add as well that that is the sense in which it is unchanging as well then because it is what God reveals. All right. We can't make it reveal. All right. 
but it's only really revealed to those who believe and have faith. Okay, okay. And the inseparable bond between the earthly church and the heavenly realm. Yeah, he mentions that in the preface, doesn't he? And that's one of the uh, one of the questions I want to ask you. Um, now, can you find still that? Sure. Go a little further. Thank you. Um, do you mind if I uh, suggest that, rightly or wrongly, I feel that you're that close? I'll tell you what I'm looking for. <laughs> Something just very, very, even universal, that can be universally affirmed. And that is the conviction that God can be known. And everything you're saying is that. I mean, it's, it's, it's another way of saying that, but I like, I want to distill it down to the very essence. It's just that work somehow. <laughs> God can be known. Okay, guys, we're going to have to work with this. If I put you that, I'm going to eat it. So that was less, maybe two minutes, two points. Oh, no. Uh, that's not good. Hold Could you also say that God wants to be known by us? I think so. What does it say? God desires not the death of the sinner, but that he turn from his wickedness and that. So how can he accomplish that will if he doesn't make himself known? So, um, so let's, let's, let's flesh that out. I mean, you can be thinking also of the, um, our society today, all around us, some of the um, doubts and the uh, attitudes and the ideas that are out there. Um, the claim that God can be known, that there is truth. That's the first thing. There is truth. There is truth. This actually flies in the face. This is one thing you might be able to speak to, Kyle, better than I can. This flies in the, f in the face of what? Uh, Socio-political uh, culture going all the way back to the 1700s, at least. The age of the so-called enlightenment which was a movement specifically against the church. So um, to say that God can be known is to say that there is truth and that he can be known. Well, okay, so then how is he known? Now we get to what you were saying, Travis, right? How, can, how is he known? He's known in all of these sources. Yeah, there has intermediaries. What's that? There has intermediaries. Um, all right. There has intermediaries, all right? Um, so, this is saying something, and, and on these lines, I want to share with you some quotes. It would have been nice if I could have put this so that I'd have it in front of all of you, because it'd be easier to follow, but that's not what I'm looking at. But I want to quote first of you from, from this book by Tom McEvely, or Machiavelli. <laughs> I don't say Machiavelli because that conjures up another fellow. I don't know how to pronounce it. I think it's Machiavelli. Thomas Machiavelli, uh, The Shape of Ancient Thought. And uh, this is, this is uh, I ask you now to, con to consider this fundamental conviction that we have flushed out of uh, Pomazansky, St. John of Damascus, Agamemnon, Du Bois, that God, that there is truth and that it can be known because it has revealed itself. But I, I don't know, do, do, you, do we yet appreciate uh, the force of what you just said, that it has revealed itself. If it had not revealed itself, could it be known? No. Okay, see, that's big. So listen to this. This is from uh, Thomas Machiavelli. He's, de he's describing the uh, philosophical assumptions of pagan philosophy, going all the way back you know, to the beginnings of philosophy in the 800s, 700s, both East and West, in other words, the Far East and in India, China, and also in the Mediterranean uh, uh, regions. It goes like this. This is page 23 and 24, if, they, if, if you're at all interested. The shape of ancient thought. 
Thomas McEvely, or however you say you pronounce it, I think it was published in 2002. He says, from the question, what is the origin of the universe? What is the origin of the universe? And no, I don't, the, you, you pay, pay attention to this. This is not saying what Florovsky is saying. Uh, what is the origin? It doesn't mean when did, the, when did the creation begin. It's not what it's saying. It's how, it's how did it begin. What, what, is the, what is the source that from which everything is flowing? And in pagan thought, it's always flowing from that source. And this is one of the areas that Christian thought uh, threw a grenade into pagan thought. And this is what Noah's going to share with us in a couple of weeks from Father George's Um What is the origin of the universe? You remember, you realize, uh, those of you who have studied mythology understand that this is the uh, issue, this is the question of, my, of myth, of mythology. Uh, mythology is, you know, the great myths of, of, the, of, uh, of the history of world religions or of the world, uh, they all begin with how the world began, began you know? The Enuma Elish, uh, Marduk and, or not Marduk, uh, Tiamat and Apsu, uh, the sweet waters and the bitter waters mingling together. Well, that looks a lot like yin and yang out, way out in the, fir, in the Far East. Um, and then a whole bunch of uh, very uh, charming, um, you know, quaint stories of how the things came to be as they are. But again, we have to be careful what we understand by came to be. When we're talking pagan philosophy, we do not mean by that what we would mean from the biblical revelation, that things came to be from out of nothing. And from the pagan philosophical, philosophical point of view, there never was a time when there was not matter. And I think that that's what causes the, the, main, the two basic schools of thought, I think you could say, uh, the, the monistic and the dualistic, but they all eventually dissolve into monism. That is to say, um, is the world is is the world of becoming just the uh, the uh, the one the, the uh, that which is um, you know um, disseminating itself or, or emanating from itself, or do you have two eternal principles? You know the good, the evil. You have God. You have the evil. Uh, you have spirit. You have matter. However you want to say it, uh, like like Zoroastrianism, the Pers Persian religion. But this is what uh, Thomas goes McEvely goes on to say. From the question, what is the origin of the universe, the first philosophical question was derived. What is the foundation or principle of the universe or the reasoning behind it? What is the foundation or the principle of the, re of the universe or the reasoning behind it? Astronomy and geometry. Astronomy and geometry. in combination, both of them together, seemed to offer a way to bring things together into a whole through a mathematically ordered system <coughs> for conceiving both time, so time is, made, is, uh, is gauged or uh, percept, perceived, it's, 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 it, you can lay hold of it through uh, astronomy, you know, the movement of the sun, the moon, the stars, um, and space through geometry. So the two principal dimensions, I guess, whatever you want to call them, of, of reality, space and time, they can be perceived, they can be, they can be known, they can be grasped somehow by the mind through the study of astronomy and geometry. The first philosophical question, the problem of the one and the many, which is just another version of the way he framed it just above, what is the foundation or principle of the universe? Or in other words, what is the one? What's the one from which the many are derived? Or from which the many come and you know, become? Or you could even say, uh, what is the one who is that is the source of everything that comes to be? In other words, being and becoming. The two principal, well you can't call being a movement, but you know, the two principal whatevers of, of, of reality. Um, the problem of the one and the many. This is the first, what does he say? The first philosophical question. Um, and it's fascinating to me to study the earliest philosophers and see how they're simply reformulating the ancient myths. That's all they're doing. 
They're taking the poetry of the myths and they're putting it into prose. Although the first philosophers also did it in poetry. But for example, what you have for the four elements uh, of, the, of, the, of the universe, air, earth, fire, water, those are all mythological elements. Air, fire, earth, you know, Marduk, or not, uh, absolute human, yin, yang. Um, um, the problem of the one and the many expresses the same ordering impulse that fueled the obsession with astronomy and geometry. You understand why there would be an obsession with astronomy and geometry, Paul? I just have a question. Why is it a problem? Was what a problem? The one and the many. Because how do the many come to be? So people are they're reasoning that there must be a source, and then they're yes. how does that de like yes. degenerate or whatever? And yeah. where did you things? come from? Oh, okay. where, you. Where did you come from? Where are you going to go? Sure. What are you inside of you? What are you? Okay. The Upanishads, the student asked the guru, what is Brahman, you know, the, the ultimate principle? What's the answer? That art thou. There's, the, there's one solution to the one and the many. And what's the solution? You don't really exist. I mean, you do exist, but not as you. So actually, that, that engenders the whole philosophical enterprise, starting with whoever. It's kind of associated with Socrates, but he was just continuing a long-standing tradition, maybe even Absolutely. Pythagoras, um, of you know, the ascetical disciplines of philosophy through the study of astronomy and geometry in an effort to appeal away everything about you that is ephemeral, transit, that's part of the realm of becoming, and to get into the core that you are that you are, and then to ask, to, ask to, 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 to consider what is the relationship of me as what I am <coughs> to the one that is the source of everything. Do you understand? This is a very important question. It will become a very important question for Christian theology. All right. Um, so the first philosophical question, the problem of the one and the many, expresses the same ordering impulse that fueled the obsession with astronomy and geometry. You can understand why it would be an obsession. If I can figure out the, uh, fact, the more I can learn about astronomy and geometry, the closer I get to knowing what I am and what my relationship, what I really am beneath, beneath all, the, all the things about me that are changing. Um, the desire to find unifying principles behind apparent diversity. When I, you know, I read this and I thought immediately of John 8, 16, which is the, where Jesus says to the Jews, be careful that you do not judge according to appearances, but according to true judgment. So the Lord too is, is directing us to get beneath the ephemeral, the surface, and get into what we are deep down, the core, the truth that defines us, and to, uh, to come to know it. So now, but now the question becomes, okay, so what is the truth? What is that? Uh, but it is also an attempt, uh, this, this first philosophical question, uh, the one and the many, it's also an attempt to justify the claims for certainty of knowledge. If I had this text in front of you, I would ask you to underline that. Certainty of knowledge. This is what they're looking for. Certainty of knowledge that the mathematically basis, mathematically based sciences inspired. We're we not talking about modern times. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> If things are different and separate, then the universe is at large unknowable. Um, I understand that, uh, what was it, Ockham? Ockham's razor is what uh, kind of split everything into uh, at atomistic things, so that basically uh, with you know, Ockham's razor, with Joy, when it, was he in the 1600s or so? I've not studied Ockham. Well, this is just all second, third hand. 1400? Um, he basically um, um, 
destroyed the possibility for knowing anything. It kind of pro provided the foundation for what was going to come, you know, with the, uh, the enlightened philosophers and uh, the nihilists, um, so forth and so on. Um, if things are different and separate, then the universe at large is unknowable, since only specific things may be known one at a time. The, yeah, you see, catch that. We're, can you know the universal? This is kind of the issue between Plato and Aristotle, to a degree. How are you going to know the universal? What's Aristotle's solution? We've got to look at each one. That's how you know the, the universal. Plato started with the universal. From the universal, he thought he could understand each one. And in the end, though, Plato and Aristotle are on the same page. They just come at the, at the universal from different routes. Um, the preoccupation with the one of the many expressed a desire to know the universe, to know the universe in some larger sense than that. In other words, some larger sense than having to know the particulars. We want to know the universe. We want to know the universal one that makes everything to be what it is and from which everything comes to be. If we can know that one thing, we will know everything. Um, to, to, it was expressed a desire to know the universe in some larger sense than that by finding principles, universal principles, mathematical principles is what they are, um, that, would, um, that would render every situation knowable with or without experience of it. Superficial diversity was to be tamed and made knowable by apprehension of underlying unity. So, from that, I want you to reflect now on what you were just saying a while ago. That there is truth, and that it can be known, because it has revealed itself to us. Think about it. From, if, from what you heard me reading here, if you, you know, to the degree that you understood what I was reading, how would you compare the two, the two different approaches? One is <coughs> um, <coughs> human and worldly based, okay. and trying to understand it from my perspective. All right. The other comes from outside. It's revealed to right. us. Very good. Yes, go on. Uh, one is uh, trying to find the universal by the rational intellect. Mm -hmm. The other one is receiving the universal by faith. All right. That's what Cindy said. So you're on the same page. And one is um, trying to use the laws in creation to define what what came beyond creation. Um, okay. If they would even say what came beyond creation. Right? If they said that, what would they mean? They would mean the one that is co-eternal with the many, and that the many all dissolve into. Um, some Yes, Travis? One seeks to relate, relate, the other seeks to conquer. Very good. Very interesting. It's yeah. interesting perception. Pride versus humility. Okay. Okay. Um, um, I, I, I agree with what you're saying. At the same time, we do want to be careful that we're not unfair. Because they did not have divine revelation. Remember, those of you who were in the catechism class of the last Saturday, was it? The Saturday before? We read from St. Isaac of Nineveh and how belief in God is possible in the first place. Do you remember what, it's, what the starting point is? Those of you who were there? Revealed through creation? Yes, natural knowledge. Mm -hmm. Natural knowledge, or St. Isaac defines natural knowledge as uh, the, an innate capacity to discern the good from the evil. I think other Holy Fathers might call it the conscience. Okay. And as you, do, as you exercise that conscience, or that, as that natural knowledge, uh, and, and, and discern the good from the evil and adhere to the good, that's what prepares you for faith. And then faith gives birth to spiritual knowledge. So, you know, if you want to be... Um, um, 
generous with these early philosophers. Uh, we, can, we can't fault them for pursuing, their, you know, indulging their desire to know the truth. At least they're going for the truth and they're not going after carnal desire. They're seeing the seeds that were sown. There you go. They don't have the revelation to go with it. And Paul even talks about that. Where, where? I think in Romans chapter 1 or yeah, what? Yeah, where, yeah, creation um, proclaims God's glory uh, to the Gentile. Yeah. And so they are without excuse. And, uh, I mean, these philosophers, many of them, have you have to give them their due. Um, they were sincere men. And uh, they were love. you know, <laughs> what did they call their discipline? They called it philosophy, the love of wisdom. Um, I'm looking for a particular quote from St. Gregory of Nyssa, if I can find it. I think, okay, on page, in the first oration that, that was part of your reading assignment, if you got to it, um, on the page 25, well, about the last, um, let's say, let's divide the page into sixths, let's say the last five, the fifth, sixth. He says, every rational nature longs for God and for the first cause, but is unable to grasp him for the reasons I have mentioned, the reasons being that he's ungraspable, he's beyond being. And to be uh, anachronistic and go forward into Saint Maximus, the confessor, in the seventh in the se seventh century, he would say that God. He would say, if God is, we are not, and if we are, then God is not. His being is not our being. Um, in fact, he is so far beyond being that he's even beyond beyond beingness. Well, it just brings to mind where Paul was preaching to the what, Athens, where yes. he talks about the. That you have this unknown God. Yes. And, and yes. 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 So they were sincerely looking. Yes. And, and then, uh, Stuart, I'm going to put you on the spot. Remember what Pythagoras' ultimate reality was? You. Me? Yes. Why would I know that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Anybody? Math? Yes, he was a mathematician, yes. So what did he discover? Yeah, he saw it dimly. It was the one beyond the one. So they did see something. And then that takes me to the uh, Far East, the Svetasvatara Upanishad. Has another, has a, I think that's one of the most beautiful religious texts in the world, actually. And there it talks about the unmanifest beyond the unmanifest. So we see in the philosophers, um, we see in the we see in the philosophers this, what, what St. Isaac, for example, is talking about, natural knowledge, uh, seeking to know the truth. And then from this also, from St. Gregory, the theologian, on page 27, um, the uh, first oration, what is it, the oration on the Godhead, he says, reasoning, our reasoning is prodding us in our desire for God. Our reasoning is prodding us. In our desire for God, and in, in our sense of the impossibility of being without a leader and a guide, and then making us apply ourselves to things visible, and meeting with the things which have been since the beginning, even there it does not stay its course. In other words, it does not rest. So I think he's referring to the early to these early philosophers, in their desire for the One and to know the One. They pursued it with reasoning, with philosophical reasoning, using the tools of astronomy and geometry. But they got as far as they could get, and, as far, and when they got there, what did they see? Some of them saw the one beyond the one, the unmanifest beyond the unmanifest. But, it, but they didn't rest there. They kept going. And as you know, many of, the, many of our great saints, especially in the fourth century, they were students of philosophy studied at Athens, the great philosophical school of Athens, St. Gregory of Nazianzus being one of them. Um, I also wanted to, uh, to, to uh, speak to this point, but I see that our time is already <coughs> getting away from us. Um, to Garrett's point, that are we not talking about modern day? 
my friend, Father Estevan, uh, this is one of the four titles that he recommended that I get um, when I saw him last week. And so I got it. This is, one, this is the first title that came to me. I just started reason, uh, reading it. Um, but what start, struck me, it's, it's uh, by Martha Nussbaum. Uh, she's a, she was a professor at the University of Chicago. I, I think this is published in the early 2000s, so I don't know where she is now. Um, what book is it? What's that? What? It's the, the Therapy of Desire. Um, just from my first reading of it, though, I would caution you in reading it. This is like the, the, the bite of the serpent. You need to be well grounded in theology, I think, so that the, serp the, venoms, the serpent's venom does not destroy you. I mean, just as a, I don't know what to make of the fact that the first thing she quotes on the title page is from Karl Marx. So I'm all, already my, my, my fur is, is bristling. But I, I trust Father Esteban, there must be some reason why he wants me to read this. So I'm, gonna, I'm anxious to read it. Um, she talks about, um, let's see if I can, she talks about uh, the, uh, the philosophical enterprise, which she advocates in the, in the, in the university. And it says, uh, what is distinctive about the contribution of the philosophers is that they assert that philosophy, and not anything else, is the art we require. An art that deals in valid and sound arguments. An art that is committed to the truth. Okay, well, okay, yeah. But I, you know, she, she's looking. So Conscious Pilot says, what is truth? What is truth? What is truth? Uh, but this is, uh, I'm just taken by this, because another place she's going to say um, that she's constructing her own theory uh, about the therapeutic value of emotions from her own starting point. I'm thinking, interesting, interesting. Your own starting point. Your own starting point. Yes, you are a philosopher. This is philosophy. But you know, she's hungry. She's hungry. She's looking for the truth. Okay, well, I, uh, I guess I shouldn't be surprised that um, we're already exhausted what I wanted to say. I do want to say some more things, but we'll, I'll say them when we get back from the break. Let's, let's break with this. I want to, put, want to put in your mind this picture that um, in the, on, the, on the Stoa, you know, the, uh, the, 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 where was it, Athens, where uh, all of the uh, schools of philosophy were, and each, each philosopher had his own porch. Um, I read the story long ago. I forgot the details now. Maybe some of you have read it. You can fill in the details for us. At least in one of the philosophers, or maybe the main philosopher, maybe that was the philosopher of Pythagoras, that in his school, um, in order to enter into the school, you know, the, the classroom, um, you had to pass under a portico. And on the portico um, was the inscription, uh, let him, let's say something like, um, um, let him who, uh, uh, let him who does not, no one who does not know astronomy or geometry may enter. It's more eloquent than that, but that was the gist of it. In other words, in order to enter into the philosopher's room, in order to begin discoursing, discoursing on, on ultimate questions of truth, you were required to know astronomy and geometry. Now, when you come into a traditional Orthodox church, that has been built from the ground up according to orthodox architectural theological principles. What do you come into? Come into a nave. There's a dome up there that represents the heavens. So you're coming into an image, an icon of the universe. And what's at the very top? Christ. Christ Pantocrator. And how is he portrayed? Down on us. Well, he's like this. Or he might be like this. Yeah. He's embracing the whole world. Oh, nice. So, what's the principle of the universe that the that, that the church is telling us? He is the one. Christ is the one. Yeah. Christ is the one. Not mathematics, but in fact, <laughs> speaking of mathematics, he's one of three who are one. A holy trinity that is beyond mathematics. And what do you need to know? What do you need to learn? 
come into the church. When you come under the portico, we don't have an inscription, but what might we have? A cross? So what are we called to learn? What are you, if, you're going to, if you're going to enter here, what are you going to be taught? How to deny yourself? How to take up your cross? And how to lose your life so that you may gain it and find it in Christ? But how do we find it in Christ? By putting to death what's earthly in us, right? And learning to love our enemy as he loved us. So you see the different, you see that there are, there are similarities between uh, these different schools of thought, like we, I quote from St. Macarius the Egyptian a lot, his fifth homily, he says the, uh, the world of Christians is one thing and the world, uh, the, the world of men is another. And the difference between them is great. The difference between astronomy, geometry, and love, loving, of, loving your enemy. That's the difference. Well, okay. So we'll continue with this discussion after the break. So uh, let's say uh, 8 o'clock. Is that okay? 8 o'clock. We'll go 30 minutes and we'll be done. And the different ways of coming to know the truth. Um, I, and I uh, refer to Martha Nussbaum um, stating that the, uh, what, what she said, what constitutes the philosophical enterprise is argumentation and critical reasoning and a commitment to the truth. Uh, which, you know, is, is good in so far as it goes. But um, I do want to, um, I do want us to um, reflect on that in the light of what the Holy Fathers tell us, what the scriptures tell us, what the church tells us. Um, because uh, if we're not, um, if we're not careful, remember how the Lord uh, induced uh, Eve and Adam to fall. He, uh, in fact, <laughs> I just happened to have it. It was the trick of the evil one. This is from St. Gregory. His, uh, his oration on the Godhead, page 27. It was the trick of the evil one who abused good to an evil purpose. Okay, so St. Isaac says that the preparation for faith is to, is to exercise your innate knowledge, your innate intuition, uh, your conscience of discerning between good and evil. Okay? So far, so good, but then we have this. It was the trick of the evil one who abused good to an evil purpose, as in most of his evil deeds. For he laid hold of their desire in its wandering in search of God. You hear what, how this is referring to what Martha Nussbaum said. That the philosophical enterprise is argumentation with critical reasoning and a commitment to the truth. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. And it's a search for the truth. But oh, oh, let's be careful. Leading it by the hand, let me start over. For he laid hold of their desire in its wandering in search of God in order to distort to, in order to, distort to himself the power and to steal the desire. What was Eve's desire? To become like God. But that was what she was made for. They were made in the image and likeness of God. So he stole that desire, leading it by the hand like a blind man asking a road. And he hurled down and scattered some in one direction and some in another into one pit of death and destruction. This was their, cor this was their course. But reasoning is prodding us in our desire for God. So, you know, this exercise of the innate power within us to discern good from evil needs to be exercised with all sobriety. And the Holy Fathers would say, with an eye always out for humility. Let's beware of pride sneaking in, vanity, vainglory. Beware of that sneaking in, the conceit of human wisdom. Beware of that sneaking in. Um, because if you're in the philosophical world where you can come to know the truth with a fair degree of certainty depending on your skills with geometry and astronomy um, pride, vanity is not so much an issue, is it? doesn't seem like it would be to me 
The issue would be your intellect, how skilled you are in geometry and astronomy. The more skilled you are, the closer you come to certainty of knowledge. Because uh, astronomy and geometry are somehow uh, the very structure of reality. They're, they're very, the very structure of God. Anybody not heard of the, of the Tetractus? This wonderful, beautiful pyramid of numbers with which the philosophers, the ancient philosophers, you know, with Pythagoras and all, could explain every little thing. It's, it's, it's the, uh, those of you who don't know, it's a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. The Tetractus. You can do all kinds of fascinating things with that little pyramid. Um, so that, um, you know, this, this is how you can come to, come to the knowledge of the truth in the philosophical mind. But now, if the God of the Bible is beyond all of this, what does St. Gregory say? I just closed the book. Um, he says, um, What God is in nature and essence, no man ever yet has discovered or can discover. Whether it will ever be discovered is a question which he who will may examine and decide. In other words, he's talking to a crowd of some naysayers. He's talking to some of his adversaries, so he's kind of giving it to them. Um, in my opinion, he's, he's, I would say he's feigning humility. Um, I mean, he was humble. I don't mean that he wasn't humble, but I mean, he's kind of being, he's kind of being sarcastic. In my opinion, it will, ne it will be discovered that it will be discovered when that within us, which is godlike and divine, excuse me, I mean our noose and our logos, shall have mingled with its like, and the image shall have ascended to the archetype of which it has now the desire. He's saying a mouthful here, so let's reflect on this in, 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 the, in the light of what we've been talking about. Um, okay, so there is truth, and it can be known. But as we said, it can be known only if it reveals itself. So then, listen, you know, remembering what we just read from St. Gregory, what is the process by which we can come to know or be, uh, prepare ourselves to receive the knowledge of God? Studying astronomy? Geometry? Okay, obviously, that, that's not, obviously not. So what is it? What must we do? Yes, Matthew. The thesis? The set of practices? Yes, yes. Or, let me read it again. What's our goal? We will, in my opinion, says St. Gregory, what God is, who God is, will be discovered when that within us, which is godlike and divine, our me, I mean our noose and our logos, shall have mingled with its like, or shall have partaken of its like, and the image shall have ascended to the archetype of which it has now the desire. In other words, um, ascetic disciplines, which implies what? Becoming more like Christ. Becoming more like Christ, which is done how? Denying yourself, taking up your cross, which means putting to death what's earthly in you, the ascetic disciplines. Putting to death what's earthly in you, um, the, the ascetic work of becoming like Christ. Emptying yourself, like St. John the Baptist says, I must decrease that he may increase. Well, that's kind of a hard, almost, almost impossible task. He decreased to the point of emptying himself to death on the cross. <laughs> That's like the standard. Who of us is going to get there? But uh, that's what we must strive for. In other words, uh, uh, attained to, to loving our enemy like Christ loved us. That's the way of theology. Um, and that's how we come to know, know the truth, which is not just one beyond the one, it is the one who is the Father, not the Son, and the Holy Spirit, co-equal, um, pre-eternal, um, a communion in which none, they don't dissolve into one another. The Son and the Holy Spirit are not emanations of the one. They, 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 are, they are who they are. They are, they, they are substantive, and yet they are one. Paul? Uh, he said that... Uh, <coughs> By this will know their his essence or nature. By this they will know you're my disciples. Well, I'm talking about what he said specifically about is he uh, is that they have he's saying that we will come to know the nature of God, like his essence. 
Uh, could it, it, based on what we read, it really seemed like they were pretty sharp in making that distinction. We read, I think, one of the other Gregory saying that we wouldn't know God yes, in you're his right. essence. You're right. So what is he getting at there? We will never know his essence. Okay. It just seemed like he was saying that we would ascend yes. to see his essence somehow. Yes. 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 This gets us into the nature of God, the essence of God, the energies of God, um, the attributes of God. Um, and it's actually one of the things that gets us to the point where East and West have, have divided over the energies of God. Are they created or are they uncreated? Um, the West generally has said that these energies of God are created, whereas the East has always maintained that they're uncreated. So the energies of God coming out of himself, ad extra, coming out of himself, and they are God, just as much as his essence is. But we will never know God in his essence, but we will know God in his energies, in his personal hypostasis. So when he says that they may, that they may know thee as, that I know the Father, that you may know me, he's talking about that you may know me personally. <clears throat> not, not my essence, but me, you may know me personally. So are we to understand uh, Gregory to be... Uh, not making the distinction when he's talking like that to the well, philosophers? No, he is making the distinction, but you raise a good point in that um, at this stage of the formulation of Christian doctrine, this distinction between uncreated or created energies and the distinction between the energies of God and the essence of God has not yet been sharply defined. And so um, that leaves room for subsequent theologians centuries later to pick and choose whoever they want to, some of the great fathers, and make them say what they want them to say. Um, but uh, St. Gregory is clearly, you, you, know, you, you read more of what he's writing, more of his writings, it becomes quite clear that he's saying that, no, God, God exists outside of himself. That's very, that's very clear. Uh, there's one passage where, he, in, I think it's in the, in the theological oration on the sun, where he speaks of the, whole, of the three persons of the Trinity as those in whom the essence exists. So in other words, the essence, which is unknowable, is embraced, if you will, by the person, by the hypostasis. You don't know the essence, but you know the hypostasis. But the hypostasis is God. Honestly, the Holy Fathers will tell us, uh, we can only understand this to a certain degree, and then finally we just have to let it be. You're not going to ascend to know God in his essence. And you don't need to. To be saved, you don't need to. But so he would just parse this out in other texts? Yes. Okay. Yes, in other texts. Yes. Yeah. Um, but that's a good question. Um, all right, so um, where were we? Um, all right. Yes, so if God is, if God is known only by revelation then the way that we're going to come to know him is by the, is through the, the ascetical disciplines of the church and becoming like God. Um, this gets us then to the, to, the, to the point that we made even in the orientation, right? That um, in order to be a theologian, in order, to, in order to be one who speaks intelligently about God, what must one become? What must one do? You know? Study geometry, astronomy? One must pray. One must become a prayer. One must be a worshiper. What does it say? Navagria says that the one who prays is the one, is the, the theologian is the one who prays. And the one who prays is a theologian. So that to do Christian theology um, requires piety, requires faith, it requires exercising and, and, and following the commandments of Christ. Awesome. So, in order to pray, you need humility too, don't you? Well, you don't need it, but you should be wanting it. Because well, okay. who of us is humble? Well, but I was. <laughs> <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah I hear what you're saying. I, I was just. I think the grace of God has shown that even the yet when we're not yet, we're, we're far from humility. Mm -hmm. He still graciously descends to us and blesses us. And if we're sincere in asking him for humility, to teach us humility, he does start teaching us. So if you're asking the Lord to teach you humility, just be on the lookout. And when things start happening to you that are 
you know, not so pleasant, don't be surprised. And accept them that this is God, what is God's way of teaching you humility, not just in the theory, but in, in concrete reality. Um, so, um, oh yes, this is what I was leading to. This is what I was leading to. Um, going back to that passage that I was reading, what was it, page 27? The evil one, the trick of the evil one, who abused good to an evil purpose, as in most of his evil deeds. For he laid hold of their desire in its wandering in search of God in order to distort to himself the power and to steal the desire, leading it by the hand like a blind man asking a road. And he hurled down and scattered some in one direction, some in another, into one pit of, it, into one pit of, this, uh, into one pit of death and destruction. Okay, so you are pursuing this good thing. You are pursuing the truth. You're exercising your reasoning, um, your powers of critical discernment. What do we need to be careful of? Right? What do we need to be careful of? That's a good thing that you're doing. Don't we need to be careful of, not, of, of discerning our thoughts? That they're good, and that, the thoughts that are from God, the thoughts that are not. Because if we're not careful like that, I mean, come on, who, who is the master of cunning argument? Who is the master arguer? Satan. Exactly. So if you're not careful, oh, he'll come and he'll take that reasoning that you're doing, which is a wonderful thing. You're searching for the truth? Well, Eve was searching for the truth. Well, she wanted to become like God. So this is what I'm talking about. Um, that, the, uh, that the reasoning faculty that we must exercise as we are pursuing the good must be guarded. It must be guarded. Uh, you're reading the Holy Fathers. How often do you come upon the, the warning against, well, the Greek word is logizmi. Sometimes it's not translated, so I, I give it to you. Logizmi. Whenever you come upon a word that says logizmi, it means thoughts or reasonings. Thoughts or reasonings. You've got to be aware of your thoughts. And the Holy Fathers will even tell us. It's in the thoughts that everything begins. Sin begins in the thoughts. So, if you're not, if we're not in love, <laughs> I mean, I, this is why we need the church. If you're not in love with the truth, but you are in love with the philosophers were in love with the truth, and yet how many of them were diverted away from what they were seeking by the very power of their reasoning? Even we who are Orthodox Christians, um, receiving the body and blood of Christ, how many of us are entrapped by our thoughts? And we don't bother to discern them. A thought comes, we think it's from God. God spoke to me. Oh, I thought this thought, that must be God speaking to me. We don't discern. And so that's how the evil one can take our reasonings and lead us away from what we're seeking, which is the truth. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to drive home, you know, that to do Christian theology is not really so easy as it is to do philosophy. It requires intense mindfulness, unceasing attentiveness, you know, constant self-checking of yourself against the word of Christ. And I would say even constant prayer, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, which should also include the yearning for her teach me humility. Guard me from vanity. Guard me from myself. Teach me humility. <coughs> Don't let me de be deceived. Now, with that, we come to full, we come first up, full circle. And I would offer that we now come back to Travis's first point. How can I, or you, what can I use? What can I fall back on? What can I rely on to, uh, to help me guard my thoughts, my reasoning? so that I'm not getting caught up in the wisdom of my, my, my conceit of my own wisdom. What, 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 what do we rely on? Travis, you want to give your answer again? All of the sources of Orthodox theology. The and they are. Let's list them the best you can. Sacred scripture, uh, sacred tradition, the dogmas, um, the, uh, the consciousness of the church, uh, the services of the church. I'm missing one. No, that's good. Everything's of the church. 
And I've told you before that um, I get most of my theology from the uh, from the Actoikos, from the Menea, uh, from those short little verses. They're just chock full of theology. Um, so, it, in order, so when that, what does that imply? If, if I'm going to be relying on the things of the church to help my, what does that imply? Doesn't that imply that I'm participating in the life of the church? The church can't just be something I do over here. It has to become my very life. My life has to become the church. Um, the liturgical rhythm of the church must become the rhythm of my life. I must immerse myself in the life of the church. Now let's let's look at the, look at it in, in these terms. Um, you know, uh, even liturgically, we, as as we, as we have just come into a new year on September first. Okay, guys, where are we going now? Where is the church heading? In all of her liturgical services, all of her prayers, all of her feasts. Where are we headed now? To the tomb. To the tomb. Um, first to the cave, and then to the tomb. And what happens in the tomb? Everything dies. And then is risen again. So what I'm saying is that to be a theologian, we simply cannot be a Christian theologian outside the church. You cannot be. The best you can be is an academic. But to be a Christian theologian, you must be in the church. You must be in the to acquire the mind of the church. Did you know, I think some of you do know, that I think there's only three men in the whole history of the church that we give the title theologian to? Who are they? John. John is one. Who's the other one? Gregory. This guy. And Simeon. Was there a fourth one? Was Palamas one? I don't know. I, I've not heard him called a theologian. But he could well be. In my opinion, he's a theologian. Um, so then, um, having made those points, then um, made them to the, you know, having emphasized them um, as best I can, to drive the point home as best I can. Um, let's let's go to Pomazansky now, and uh, let's go to page twenty-seven. And let's talk about some of the things that he's. Uh, he says this at the top of the page of 27, starting with the first full paragraph. Since faith is active in life and is a living thing, the circumstances of various epochs cause dogmatic expositions to devote special attention to those various points of faith which in that epoch is desirable, profitable, and important to make firm in the consciousness of readers. Uh, thus, in the present exposition of orthodox theology, in other words, in this book, a special place is allotted to the truly close and inseparable bond between the church on earth and the heavenly church. In other words, our spiritual communion in the church with the heavenly Jerusalem and to an innumerable company of angels, uh, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven. Here is to be found the authentic pleroma, the fullness, the Catholicity of the church. You understand that Catholic is a, it's a Greek word made from kata and holy. Kata is a preposition. That means according to, um, uh, basically. And then holy is the whole. So Catholic is generally taken to mean universal. Well, all right. But actually the word means that the whole is in every part. And the part is in the whole. So that in this particular parish, the whole mystery of Christ is present. And when you receive just one little particle of Holy Communion, you're receiving the whole mystery of Christ. Nothing is lacking. That's what it means to be Catholic. And that's why the church is Catholic. One holy Catholic and apostolic. He goes on to say that a special attention has been directed in the book to this attribute of the church because this truth has been forgotten, ignored, or completely rejected in the great part of what is called Christianity, which is a provocative statement. I'm not quite sure what he means. Um, I don't dispute at all what he's saying, but I just, I'd like to know what he's, what he, and I can, I, can, I can guess 
what he might be referring to, I can guess, but I don't know. But I wanted to turn the question to you. Um, you know, uh, what would you say? Just let's not, not let's not worry about worldly society. Let's just let's just think about your own immediate life. You know, your friends, your relationships, your circle. What would you say is the most important truth that needs to be made firm in the minds of your friends in your circle? This life isn't all there is. That's what? This life here on earth isn't all there is. Okay. Oh, there's something beyond. No. What else? Anybody else? Your own circle. I'll share mine, I think, with my own family. I think uh, what needs to be made firm is that there is truth and it can be known. I think that's why some of my family went to baseball. Because they were in a religion, you know, a Protestant church, where everything was relative. Because, like, yeah, truth, truth, there is truth, but can it be known? Well, that's another question. They didn't quite think through it. But if truth can be known, and if it has revealed itself, what does that mean? What do we sing at every vespers, at every matins? God is the Lord and has revealed himself to us. If we, this is, this is one of the questions actually that I've asked you to write upon. Um, if we say that um, there is no such thing as an orthodox doctrine, and there's no one true faith, or if it is, it can't be known, uh, and you just do all, all do the best you can, it's all relative, what are we saying about God? About he has not revealed himself. Isn't that what you're saying? He has not revealed himself. Because if he has revealed himself, well, what's the consequence? What follows? He can be known. And is he going to is he going to leave it to guesswork? So you see, this is a rather critical question. We had a visitor last Sunday. We asked him what brought you to St. Herman. He so just an ecumenical spirit. Well, I knew what he meant by ecumenical. Relative. It's all relative. I, w I had to bite my tongue. I wanted to say, did you, I wanted to say to him, did you know that you're on, the, you're on the road to nihilistic despair? Maybe you won't get there, but maybe your, your, your children will, maybe your grandchildren will, will if they don't turn around. So yeah, so so that, okay, that's, that, that's my, I said baseball. I said that's why certain members of my family, I think, went to baseball. Because baseball, you could rely on baseball. We were talking about this yesterday. You could rely on baseball. It's always, you know, the rules are the rules, although they keep changing them. <laughs> you know? and, and, and if you're out, you're out. You can't out-argue the other. You, you get the idea. So my, you know, he was looking for something that was stable, something that could be relied on. He couldn't find it in his church or in his group of churches. So he became increasingly bitter, bitter and cynical about that, I think. And he found his stability in baseball. Where are you getting? I think a lot of people are relying on those Vikings. <laughs> and, they're, and they're very reliable for letting you down. All but, right. e but even then, they, everybody still gets, disappo gets disappointed. It's like, well, you know, you, you know. Vikings never win the Super Bowl, you know. I think that's the uh, meaning of uh, Charlie Brown and Lucy and the football. Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically. I yeah. think so. This time we're going to do it. This time we're going to do it. All of our yeah, five years. All, 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 all my family is all excited. They all got season tickets. And Somebody and else, I mean, share with you what, what can show. I, I want, I'm stuck back on a comment you made between the East and the West and the split. But the East really looked it, it was focused on the uncreated energy. And the West yes. to the creative. Yes. Can you say more about that? Well, that would involve a few volumes. Uh, yeah, Kyle, do you want to speak to that? Oh, um, well, uh, I mean, maybe. Uh, <laughs> Let's say it like this, Kyle. Let's say it like this. Um, you have the sun. You don't dare go under the sun, you'll burn out. Mm -hmm. But the sun has rays. In the winter, the sun is shining through the window. Not the sun, but it's rays. But you say the sun is shining through the window. And you want to get warm, so you put your chair in the sun, you say. But you're not putting it in the sun, and yet you are putting it on in the sun. So the rays of the sun would be the energies of God. And they are uncreated. uncreated. They are the sun. 
You see, in my opinion, um, and you can take it or leave it, but the West never quite shook the shackles of pagan philosophy. It was too fascinated with Aristotle and, through, and, and Plato, and uh, understood the problem of the one of the Holy Trinity too closely to the to the uh, to the the way that the pagan philosophers understood the one and the many, where the three persons. And we talked about this before in the book a couple of years ago. Remember the classical description of the Trinity as the triangle. Mm -hmm. You have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit inside the triangle. So the essence is the triangle, and the persons are in the essence. So you can't know them. And what's the issue about that? Why is that such an issue? Well, if the person is trapped by its essence, then the Son, if he's God, by essence, in essence, he cannot become flesh. He simply can't. Because if he's, if he's God in essence, he can't have a beginning. It's opposed to his essence. But if the energy is created, if he exists outside of his essence, and again that takes us back to uh, this passage from St. Gregory of Nazianzus uh, in his th uh, oration on the sun, that the persons are those in whom the essence exists. Now you have the hypostasy, the persons of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit existing outside of the essence. So now they're free to act in a way that is contrary to their essence. So now the Son is free to become man. And we say it in the liturgy. O thou who without change didst become man. You became, you changed without changing. Without changing, you changed. That's the S, that's, so, you know, so, you could, I would argue um, that the, the, the nub of the difference of the split between East and West actually began in the fifth century um, over the philosophy, if you will, of the person, of the hypothesis. And um, breaking free from the philosophical models of ancient thought. And along with that goal goes the issue of the created energies or the uncreated energies. Because what's at issue is how to explain in the way that the mind can grasp, to the degree it can grasp, the mystery of the incarnation. So that we can assert, we can acclaim, we can proclaim, um, not just by assertion, but even by reasoning, that uh, God the Son truly became flesh. He truly became man for our salvation. Yes, Kyle? Um, sort of on that note. Uh, excuse me. So Cheryl thought Jesus is not Jesus and, and the Son of God. So when you pray to Christ, you're not pray, you're, you're, it's not split. Who am I praying to? Jesus or, or the Son of God? To put it crassly. Okay. Okay? Um, that reminded me, speaking about uh, the essence energies and uh, the Western view, of created, is this something that is created, or in the East it's uncreated? And you know how we sing at church, you know, like you brought up before, uh, God is the Lord and has revealed Himself to us. Um, I think it might be an issue that the grace in the Eucharist in the West is created, and so there's like a separation between God and man. Because yes, and that leaves room for a pope to insert himself. <laughs> but if you're not in the Roman Church, it leaves room for you to insert yourself. You become the pope. The Protestant Reformation just traded a million popes for one. That's all. But would you agree that that is like creating like a separation? Yes, I would agree with that. Makes God, you can't yes. like experience God. And that's when I read. Augustine, I have to read all of Augustine, because there are parts where Augustine sounds like a Nestorian, a real Nestorian. But there are other parts where he's clearly not a Nestorian. But again, you see, uh, Pomazansky talks about the development of doctrine, to the degree to, to how does it develop, how does it not develop? Well, it, it develops in the sense of formulating and making more precise the revelation 
of Scripture. Um, and so it protects, in that formulation, it protects the, uh, the clear proclamation of Scripture that God is the Lord and has revealed himself to us. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us to protect that from any um, explanation or dogma that would, in effect, deny it. Okay? So, all right. You confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. What, did you read the back of the bulletin last Sunday? What do you do with the Virgin Mary? We had the uh, veneration of the, icon, of the Holy Fathers of the Seventh Ecumenical Council. The restoration of icons to the church. If you believe that Jesus is God, the Son of God incarnate, where are your icons? Where's your priesthood? Where are your sacraments? This is why I'm trying to illustrate why dogma that is faithful to the proclamation of Scripture is not an irrelevant matter. If you're not careful, yeah, you'll, you'll proclaim that Jesus is the Son of God, and they'll feel right that uh, what the Orthodox Church teaches, that when I'm praying to Christ, I'm praying to the Son of God, not to somebody else who's connected to him. But then you turn around and you deny, you deny what you just confessed and everything else that you do. You have no, no, no appreciation, no veneration of the Virgin, without whom there is no salvation, because there's no incarnation. You know, so forth and so on. You get the point. So it's not a near well matter. But again, let's, let's, let's close with this, because we're not past the time. Let's close with this. Let's, go, let's get back to what, I, what, what is the main point, really, that I want to stress. And that is that there is truth, that the truth is, can be known, but it is known as it has revealed himself. Going to Hebrews chapter 1, in the days of old he revealed himself to the prophets, but in these last days he has revealed himself to, his, to us through his Son which is his church, <laughs> the Orthodox Church that Rome used to be part of, the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. So, um, in order, and so in order to see this doctrine, one must become a prayer. That's why you don't have to be good at astronomy or geometry to be a good Christian. All right, well, time's up. So let's say a closing prayer. All right. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit, to bless you, hope you have all ever blessed and most pure in the mother of our God, more honorable than the cherubim, and more glorious beyond compare than the seraphim, without corruption, just thou give birth to God, the word, truth, and the Holy Spirit, to magnify thee. Christ is in our midst. He is and shall be.